Oh, and welcome back. Welcome back to Keeping It Real. We're talking Leonard Peikoff. We're talking the book, Keeping It Real. We're talking podcast questions and answers. And this week, and this is going to connect to everything we've been talking about and a few things that are coming up, fantasy, science fiction, romanticism. You know, Atlas Shrugged has been described as a science fiction novel, and it has a bit of a science fiction plot element that's central to the progression of events. And I'm looking forward to discussing that with James Valiant. James, how are you doing today? Really wonderfully. I mean, my gosh, yes. Life is just splendid, isn't it? Is it not? It really is. And in the connection of fantasy, science fiction, cartoons and comic books, you had a great discussion yesterday with Rodney Schroeder on uh, famous or famed or infamous some say reclusive, but no, he was just a man with a certain amount of privacy about his life. The great Steve Ditko. That oh. was a great conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we hope to have more conversations like that. You had a wonderful uh, discussion of Rush, for example, where Ayn Rand has had an influence in popular culture. And even where Ayn Rand hasn't maybe had such a big influence in popular culture or varying degrees of influence, uh, we hope to have future discussions. Star Wars. Star Trek, Lord of the Rings. Uh, I, there are all kinds of uh, issues here about uh, fantasy, sci-fi, romanticism that we that are going to be connected, I think, to maybe discussions that will be coming up as well as uh, the discussion we had yesterday. We may even have more discussions about Steve Ditko. It's going to be really, really good. And I'm up for all of it, although I'm not an expert on most of it. I'm a bit promiscuous in that regard. I wouldn't call myself a, a science fiction slut because that would be a rude term to use on this show. But a little of everything. And I am looking forward to all of that. But first, Don't yeah, let's shame me. <laughs> no shaming at all, at least not in that regard. Part of what regard. we're going to talk about today, that's going to be part of the discussion today. I'll be making connections as we go along, but let me jump right in because question number one that you have selected for us that Leonard Peacock was asked and that he answered on his podcast, is Atlas Shrugged, that, that, that science fiction book, is Atlas Shrugged the most philosophically ambitious novel and artwork ever created? It's, it's a great question because to a lot of us, <laughs> We would describe Atlas Shrugged as the ultimate American novel, the greatest American novel. Yes. Uh, and for many of us, our favorite book, although The Fountainhead for me edges it out on that strictly personal level. But is it? Is it the most philosophically ambitious and you know the greatest artwork ever produced? Now, you might think Leonard Peikoff would jump in and say, oh, yeah, of course. Of course, Ayn Rand, the greatest philosopher ever, the greatest writer ever, the great... My initial, my initial, my knee, my patellar reflex uh, when someone says, is Atlas Shrugged the most philosophically ambitious work of art ever? Is yes, obviously. Oh, yeah. Can you think of a work of art that in its scope, in its philosophical depth, is anything like as ambitious? Most artists, as Ayn Rand pointed out, well, are artists expressing the values of their time. They're not original philosophers. Uh, very rarely do you have uh, the combination of both an original artist and an original philosopher. And so, for example, the novelists that Ayn Rand very much uh, uh, admired, say Victor Hugo or Dostoevsky, they had values that were very different from Ayn Rand's. One was a Christian socialist, one was a Christian conservative, and she very much disagreed with their philosophical values. But on the other hand, they, she thought they were brilliant artists. Whereas Ayn Rand is not only, and she says this even at some point in her own writing about it, she's doing something very remarkable. She's doing something artistically creative, and doing something philosophically creative. So it's a new set of philosophical values expressed by a new artistic means. And so she's both a great artist and a great philosopher. And in fact, find the way her style and the substance match and blend and reflect one another. She, so if you were to ask me on the service of it, it's obvious to me that Atlas Shrugged in one sense, as far as I know, and I mean, you're going to ask me about American novels, you know, really good American novels, The Scarlet Letter or Huckleberry Finn or something. Uh, yeah, or oh, Grapes of Wrath. You, you ask me all, about all the great American novels, I have to tell you, yeah, it is 
certainly the greatest of all, the great American novels in my view, but more than that, it is the most philosophically ambitious literary artwork that I can think of in the history of human beings. Uh, that would be my initial response, quite honestly. You know, it's it's interesting because you're right, and and I have that same initial reaction. What other artwork touches on? and not just touches on and showing in the action, which is always more important in a story, but is explicit about metaphysics, about epistemology, about ethics, about politics. It's interesting because there are other epistemologically great stories, for example. Yes. Uh, Ayn Rand pointed out that The Miracle Worker, the story of Helen Kenner, is, is an epistemologically great novel or yes. great movie, um, but it's not explicit. It's but not how and what an extraordinary thing that is. She points out that The Miracle Worker is the only uh, literary work she knows of that has an explicitly epistemological theme. <laughs> now, can you imagine a literary work focusing on how all our knowledge begins and arises with sense perception? Now, if you were to say to an artist, now write me a play, a dramatic, interesting play <laughs> about this point of epistemology, uh, <laughs> How would you do it? Uh, the Miracle Worker is astonishing in that regard. So philosophically, it is a, a re remarkable point, uh, uh, piece on that point. Uh, still not as ambitious as Atlas Shrugged, though, in my view. Yeah, and, and we could, I could talk more about that, how it may be the most epistemologically great work out there in, in, in its plot, in, in what it shows. Could you have imagined the greatest validation of the evidence of the senses in art would come from a story about a blind woman. Incredible, right. <laughs> but but still, we have to consider Atlas Shrugged. The, 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 uh, spoiler alert, but there is a speech in Atlas Shrugged that validates not just the evidence of the senses, but epistemology as such, and, and gives the basics that wasn't fully fleshed out until Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, but it's all in there. She outlines an entire system of philosophy, metaphysics, the basics of epistemology, the basics of ethics, ethical values, the application of ethical values to politics, even art itself. An entire outline for an entire system of philosophy is presented in the book as a valid dramatic element of it. It's not as though she went out of her way just to tag this speech onto some novel about something else. No, no, it's relevant. It drives the story. It's a plot element. It is an astonishing, this is what I mean when I say it's this ambitious. She's connected dramatically this philosophical theme in a way you'll never read in another novel. That's all I can say. Now, let's get to Leonard's answer because he actually uh, will pull Pull me back to reality here in some way. He, he will, because I could I could go on and on about it. I could too. We could, could spend the whole hour saying, well, here's the case for. For, <laughs> exactly. But Leonard Peikoff, he doesn't say it's not so much as he brings us, he's keeping it real. He's bringing it back to earth. He says, well, how do you judge the degree of ambition? Dante has every detail of his philosophy, as far as he understands it, in the Divine Comedy. Now, of course, he doesn't give a theory of concepts, but he doesn't think a theory of concepts is essential to Christianity. So it's impossible to say. What I would say, again, this is Leonard Peikoff, what I would say is two things. Atlas Shrugged is the most rational philosophy ever created in, or not in, a work of art. And within the Romanticist school, it is the most ambitious because the Romanticists generally did not concern themselves with philosophic themes. Now, there are many other schools of art that do concern themselves with broad ideas. The most extreme is what's called socialist realism. Just to pause for a moment, if that's not an oxymoron. Uh, okay, back to Leonard. The most extreme is what's called socialist realism, which was a communist version of art authorized and demanded by Stalin that required that art be an exposition in preaching dialectical materialism. So if you're going to go by socialist realist art, well, there's an awful lot more philosophy on a page by page basis than there is an Atlas Shrugged. Now, as to whether that's art, well, you read my books to see what I think of that one. 
Right. And then he wraps up like this. He says, well, I'd be careful. Atlas Shrugged is a wonderful novel, but don't take every word that's good. Put or every, Yeah, don't take every word that's good. Put a most in front of it and say, well, that's what Atlas Shrugged contributes. Unquote Leonard Peikoff. And I've, I've had to say to people before, now I'm a, I'm a bit of a musician. And it, uh, we're doing nerdy topics today, so I have on my nerdy tie. But this is also a, for, from the old TR-808 drum machine. I'm a musician. And in musical circles, people are very quick to say, this was the greatest rock band ever. Neil <laughs> Peart was the greatest drummer ever. Drummer and, ever. Then, and then the jazz fans come along and say, what are you talking about? And rock and roll musicians aren't even real musicians. And they have evidence to back it up. But my belief is that when you reach that level of greatness, then it doesn't make any sense to argue about whether Michael Jackson or Paul McCartney were the greater musician. At that level of greatness, you know, all, all I can say is that Atlas Shrugged may well be the greatest novel ever written. It may well be the greatest philosophical exposition ever made in fiction. But at that level, there, there, there's just no sense of arguing between you know, the difference in kind, really. I mean, it's yeah. like someone saying, who is the greatest uh, dancer in film? Was it Fred Astaire or Gene Kelly? Well, I, when you're talking, like you say, when you're talking about such create uniquely creative artists, and at the absolute pinnacle of their field, obviously brilliant, creative, genius artists who just put every, their whole entire being into their dance and are just spectacularly the best, like that. It, you know, I, I, so there, I'll, I'll be honest here too. Iron Man had a favorite for just about everything. There are some times when I just can't, I have my favorites. It's like I have a handful of things that I think are my top in it. But when you press me on it, if you were to press me, who is the greater dan male dancer in uh, mo American movies, Fred Astaire or Ginger or uh, uh, Gene Kelly, Ginger Rogers, she may, win the, she may actually win the, the contest because she had to do everything backwards and in heels as she said, <laughs> Fred did. Anyway, but if you were to press me on, you know, Gene Kelly versus uh, Fred Astaire, I might say, oh God, you're asking me to make a, a nearly impossible uh, decision. For my own personal values, I prefer Fred Astaire. I prefer that elegant, you know, the light touch and that Fred Astaire brought as opposed to the dramatic athleticism. But I can see someone making a rational case the other way. Um, now, as he points out, for example, with Dante, let's look at some of the great epics in uh, Western literature, whether it's Homer, Dante, Milton. These are great epic stories, and they are philosophical, and they are systematic about philosophy in a way that Atlas Shrugged is. Dante is indeed presenting the whole of his Christian metaphysics and ethics as, as he understands it to be. So he's giving you, he is, in a sense, being as ambitious as he could be as a poet, 700 years ago. <laughs> and in that sense, it's a kind of Christian Atlas Shrugged from the 1300s, Dante's Divine Comedy, if you will. It's the opposite of objectivism in every way. It's not romantic realism, no, but is it philosophically ambitious on that scale? Absolutely. But I would also say there are other great epics in poetry and so forth that have had that uh, level of ambition to take on philosophy as I know it and explain it as thoroughly as I possibly can through drama. Yeah, there have been other Atlas Shrugs in that sense, but I still go back to my original answer. <laughs> Atlas Shrugged gets it right and gets it right in the right way. Uh, but you know, it is even Atlas Shrugged doesn't contain Ayn Rand's theory of concepts. Just a thought. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, <clears throat> you know, as you suggest, they're, they're actually different projects. Homer was not doing the same thing as Walt Whitman or Emerson, yeah. or, and even when we talk about writers like Emerson, somebody who I enjoy reading, and I will always call back to Leonard Peikoff's point that there is a survival value <laughs> to philosophically great, even though philosophically false art. But at that highest level, yeah, you know, I have a favorite rock band, for example, but I couldn't put that band on and listen to them all day, every day to the exclusion of everything else. I would never lose my respect for the musicians, but I would be bored out of my mind. So there are but complexities point, both in the production and, and the consumption. 
Yeah, at some point, even you and I might get tired of yes all day long. <laughs> Hard to imagine, but but that is hard to imagine, happen. but it might happen. <laughs> right now, question number two kind of talks about that idea. What if we just figured out what the greatest artwork was, and let's just keep reading that over and over again? But first, I want to give a shout out because in the chat, of course, I love love seeing the messages going on in the chat, and also we've got Michael. Michael Sweet has been a member for thirteen months, so if you're a member of the YouTube channel not the ARC UK, which you should also be a member of. Link is at the top of the chat. But on the YouTube channel, extra fun you can find there and an additional way to support the ARC UK. And Michael says, super excited about this episode, gentlemen. Thank you for that. But then he has also gifted an Ayn Rand Center UK membership. You can do that with those YouTube memberships. You can just buy them and give them out as gifts. Say you're already a member. And that is fun. Hannah AA has picked that up. She's now a member. Thanks to that gift from Michael. So yes, by all means, buy those memberships gift them out if you've already got your membership that is one it's not only supporting the ARC UK but it's great fun I, I enjoy my super chats would love to see some of those today as well I enjoy making my comments stand out it's all win-win I know Yarn broke on his shows a value for value and I believe in that but also make it selfish make it as selfish as you can make it enjoy supporting the organization if you enjoy these works it's it's a great feeling to put your money where your mouth is and have fun with it I want to see more of that. Now, there's only so much fun you can have reading Atlas Shrugged and then thinking, I could read something else, but no, let me read Atlas Shrugged over again. And again, and again, well, maybe it's where you want to be. Maybe it's the universe you want to escape to. Question number two. Leonard Piaf was asked, can reading Ayn Rand ever be escapism rather than legitimate refueling? And I'll give Leonard Peikoff's answer right away because it's it's fairly short. And it seems obvious until you make that mistake yourself. He says, anything can be escapism. If by that you mean getting away from the dull, depressing scene around you to something better. Now, stopping the quote for a second here, he's talking about escapism not in, in a bad way. Uh, just, well, here, I'll go on. But just to lay that out ahead of time, he says, for instance, <laughs> This took me a moment. Sex can be escapism, and perfectly legitimately so, in bomb shelters. Uh, unquote for a second here. It's interesting that Leonard Pigoff is old enough, and I, I'm old enough at least to remember that the phenomenon was out there, of bomb shelters. And this was not the air raid shelter at your local public school. There were people who built bomb shelters in their own yards, underground, in case those nukes started flying. And in the days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, that was not such a crazy idea. There are still people <laughs> alive who remember when the Nazis were sending V-2 rockets to slaughter civilians in London. And the poor people of London had to go down into the tube, the underground, to uh, survive the bombings. And uh, down there, there was a different sense of reality and camaraderie. Amazing, heroic sense of camaraderie and and sticking together and uh, trying to survive the Nazi blitz uh, during World War II. Uh, but the reality is that it's a strange moment where, hey, we're under bond. This could be it. And people have a whole different attitude <laughs> about spending what could be their last few hours on Earth, uh, how they're going to spend it. And most people, if they were parents, for example, would spend it with their children or if they were there with uh, someone they were close to romantically or someone, someone who was interesting to them, they would, in fact, and what a pro-life, in my view, thing to do. Rather than focus on this, our last hour of existence, why don't we have an end in itself sort of experience to celebrate our existence as we go? Uh, exactly right. Yeah. And one of the themes I wanna come out of this conversation, and this will go back to Lee Pearson's last show, is the value of thought experiments. Imagination is not just fantasy or escapism, but here yeah. Leonard Pigoff starts out by talking about not escapism, but just escape from the mundane or the ordinary. I'll go on quoting him real quick here. He says, well, sex can be escapism and perfectly legitimately so in bomb shelters. And it's very common there because people think, well, they're going to die any minute. Music can be escapism. Having a stake when everything is awful can be escapism. And then he goes on. I think the real question is, what is the bad sense of? 
escapism. In other uh, words, the refusal to efface reality, an act of evasion. I would say in that sense, well, Ayn Rand is a romantic. It is not an escape because she's a romantic realist. And unquote for a second, there are folks who, who know Ayn Rand already know that. But her idea of romantic realism, she regarded that as her, her literary school. I um, and we'll, think that could be and yes. ought to be. Not just an expression of values, but an expression of reality and what is possible. Uh, mm -hmm. so what could be and ought to be. Very interesting approach Ayn Rand had to her romanticism. Yeah. Right. And to the question I teased with, he goes on, but it is escapist. It is bad just to read and reread and reread her, turning away from the world, living a meaningless life, and just coming alive only when you read her. You've given up on, you've given up then. You're tired of reality. You've taken her as a substitute, not as a fuel for moving on, but as a world in which you can stand still. So I would say don't do that for a short while. When you're young, it's okay. When I was 16, again, this is Leonard Pigoff, when, although I know the feeling. When I was 16, I just read The Fountainhead over and over and over again and didn't do anything else because I had no idea what to do and I did not want the world around me. I got to finally memorize the book, but I came out of that. I wouldn't do that as a continuous way of life. Unquote, man, I know that feeling. Of, I, you know, I want to stay in this world. I just yeah. finished this book. Maybe I should reread it again. <laughs> when you read a really wonderful book, you want to linger in that universe. You know, I think part of, you know, uh, obviously a good uh, novel is an end in itself, and it comes to a end, and that's that. And, you know, people will, we've discussed this before on many occasions, people will build fiction on fiction and speculate what ifs and do all kinds of mind experiments with novels, but a novel is what it is. And it's an end in itself and a contained thing it has to be judged on its own terms. On the other hand, if the a writer is really good, they put you into a universe or give you this sense of uh, the world is, is that you want to linger in. I want to go back. I want to just dwell in that. Oh, can I go back and just relive that that experience of being there with the, that amazing cocktail party conversation with Dominique or that amazing moment where Howard Rourke is appreciating his own art? And you think, I want to re-experience that. I need that, 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 that moment again in my life. Uh, yeah, if what you're doing is avoiding reality, if it's becoming an it, not just an end in itself emotionally as that experience, but as a way of evading something else. How, you, you look, you, you, your own life is what matters. Your own happiness is what matters. Never lose sight of your own purpose. This is just fuel. This is just an emotional way of experiencing our values so that we can be fueled to do the rest of our life, uh, pursue our productive purposes, to pursue our goals in life. This is fuel. It is a way to emotionally experience our values that we can't get from something else. Don't ever feel bad about losing yourself completely in that world. But on the other hand, never use that world as a means of evading this world. Your real purpose is what you really have, the, important, the importance of your life. Your life is what's important, not that work of art. Your, that work of art is only important insofar as it's a reflection of your values and fuel for the rest of your life. You, you see, when we, even when objectivists say that art is an end in itself, what we're saying is that it is serving a vital psychological function. Don't ever lose sight of that. That doesn't mean it's an intrinsic value, like, you know, virtue is its own reward, art is its own uh, virtue. No, 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 no. Uh, we do, objectivists don't believe that. There is still a purpose, an instrumental purpose, that art is serving in your life, even if the experience is, as we describe it, an end in itself. Excellent. Yeah, it's, it's, as Ayn Rand says elsewhere, it's only life that is an end in itself. Well, art she makes the point repeatedly that for all of the work that art does, its primary purpose is strictly as an end in itself, strictly to serve that life that is an end in itself. Now, I've got to jump real quick to the super chat. We've got our first super chat. Well, second one after the member chat, but first dollars that came in. And thank you for supporting the Ayn Rand Center UK adherent of Lady of Columbia's in and says, well, the problem with the woke is that they use the Gramscian method of subsuming all methods of escapism 
you know, Marcuse, you know more about that than I do, James, but that idea of taking over all of the institutions. Anyway, he goes on, the Gramscian method of subsuming all methods of escapism so you can never escape from their agitprop. Oh, their, agi yeah. their agitation yeah. propaganda. Absolutely. <laughs> I and get some that. And we really get the idea that much of our culture is just some kind of agitprop. And uh, yeah, and there are, in fact, people out there, uh, certainly cultural Marxists out there who want every aspect of our culture to reflect like these socialist realists that Peikoff was talking about. Absolutely. Um, no, uh, you know, I'm bothered most of the time when there is a politics to a work of art. There's, politics is politics. Now, can a, a book have a political theme like 1984 or, or We the Living? Yeah, absolutely. A book can have a political theme and political themes are important in literature. But politics isn't my reason when I read even a politically themed book. I'm experiencing it as an art form, an art form. And by the way, my art forms, uh, only one little narrow category of my art forms will even bring up politics. Politics isn't the thrust of my of my whole cultural outlook, as it is for so many. Got Gramsci, yeah, Marcuse, yeah, your cultural Marxists out there, yeah, everything's got to be part of this political. You know, Ayn Rand is often accused of. This is a strange thing to me. She developed her whole philosophy as a justification for her politics. Whoa, talk about getting it exactly backwards. No, Ayn Rand's commitment was to reason, reality, selfishness, properly understood. Those were the primary concerns of which the politics was merely an expression. I think it's more like a confession on the part of many of these left-wing people. For them, everything, for their perspective, is a justification of their political, <laughs> the political outcome they want, like these socialist realists. And that's what makes that kind of didactic propaganda so damned boring. Yes. Yes. And in that regard, I've got to say, we've got another super chat from adherent of Lady of Columbia that makes exactly the point you just said, James. <laughs> Normally, I would say going going from the profound to the ridiculous, but this is a, the opposite. We're going from the ridiculous, today's political situation, to the profound. Adherent of Lady of Columbia says, Jim Steinman and Meatloaf are undervalued romantics. If you know anything about Jim Steinman and his relationship to the singer of Meatloaf, um, Steinman wrote rock operas and kind of like Steve Ditko, he had his own view of the world that informed everything he created. Now, in his case, it was, you know, rock and roll and teenage vampires and all sorts of quirky things. But it, it meant that he produced, as I say, rock operas, these, these big productions, think, you know, Total Eclipse of the Heart, you know, his work with Bonnie Tyler. I can't I can't help but agree with adherent to Lady Columbia, Jim Steinman and Meatloaf, whatever you think of them, whether that's your your They're ambitious your super art. Not. ambitious art. Yeah. In one sense, it's ideologically ambitious art. And that's great because it brings us right to question number three. Some people would say, Jim Steinman, he was a great musician, he was a great writer, a composer, but you know, vampires <laughs> and paradise by the bat dashboard lights, is that is that romanticism? So question number three of the questions you have hand-selected for us, James. I like comic books and superheroes, but not only are the heroes altruistic, they also opposite, operate outside the laws of nature. So are comic books harmful to young readers? Well, as I said, we're going to keep tying things together in this session. And I'll give Leonard Peikoff's answer real quick here. He says, I disagree with you. On every point, they are not <laughs> altruistic, not, not the ones I have read. They are concerned with justice. They're like a police force, a super police force. They want to capture, kill, and avenge the evil. I've never seen them undertake a social or altruistic cause. I never saw Superman promote Obamacare. <laughs> it's, it's always justice. Now, you ask if it's bad that they violate the laws of nature. No, it's simply a fantasy. As I've discussed in an earlier podcast, and we'll get to more of this later, a fantasy is perfectly uh, rational as long as it has a meaning in reality. Here, the meaning is obviously good versus evil and the importance of the good winning. That, by meaning, is the opposite of today's view, multiculturalism and relativism, and don't judge anyone, and there is no good, and we're all the same egalitarianism. In that sense, it has a real 
good meaning for practical life. So are comic books harmful to youngsters? No, they offer fun, excitement, and inspiration. Such a genre gives kids something to admire, like strength, action, and commitment. I think kids can only benefit from them, unquote Leonard Peikoff. Amen. Amen. I, long before I discovered Ayn Rand, <laughs> I was a big, I grew up as a child in the 60s and in the early 70s, and I loved, you know, I didn't have those uh, uh, movies that we have now that are based on uh, the Marvel and DC universes. Uh, none of those movies. I had to have these little original comic books that were being produced back in those days, and I would walk a couple blocks to the shop where I could get my Spider-Man comic books, and Spider-Man had a huge impact on me. Are you kidding now, we were talking about realism, the real realism part of romantic realism. And I think this is the difference between, say, being a kid and being an adult. In Atlas Shrugged, I did not know, big spoiler alert, how the motor worked. <laughs> I had no idea. Nor did I know how reared metal worked chemically. I didn't. I don't even think Ayn Rand did. But those were examples where I could suspend my disbelief because things like that, where I could see all around me. There'd yes. be the equivalent of, of things like reared metal or the golf motor all around me in reality. So exactly. that, I, so that exactly. I could, the suspension of my disbelief is much easier in Atlas Shrugged. In an, if I, as an adult, I, I'm gonna be 60 years old this year. And if I, as an adult, I just simply cannot get the same thing out of a Spider-Man comic book that I did when I was 10 years old, there's just a big, big difference between uh, what I, my ability to suspend my disbelief. And that's the thing. At the age of 10, my ability to suspend my disbelief could encompass Spider-Man, Batman, Superman, Thor, and those comic book heroes that were important to me, especially Spider-Man, my absolute favorite. And I want to refer to the Ditko discussion I we, I, we had with the Schrader yesterday. It was a fun one. Um, and Steve Ditko was a comic artist who was deeply influenced by Ayn Rand and did in, and put important philosophical ideas into things, even starting with his 1960s Spider-Man comics. Spider-Man... <clears throat> was not an altruist. Spider-Man believed in it. He had his own positive sense of values and of right and wrong. And he act, it's true he acted independently of the government. In fact, he had to sneak around the government and doing what he was doing. The government kind of sus was suspicious of what he was doing. He was not being altruistic. He always had some clear personal motive that may or may not have been what was perceived to be society's motive at all. So no, 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 these weren't, no, no, but they are projections of values. They are the pursuit of, of, in fact, at my level at the age of 10 reading comic books, it was those were philosophical values to me and they were pursuing philosophical values like justice and truth. What is a Superman's motto? Truth, justice, and the American way. They're explicitly telling you what the values of the superheroes are in doing it and their independence uh, and just in terms of the sheer artistry, the muscular, dramatic, dynamic poses that could in themselves be viewed as romantic art, vi just visually romantic art, in terms of these dynamic, active, uh, and these comic artists were experts, pioneers in dynamic art and making you feel motion within a single frame and so forth. You know, in what I can only describe as a romantic way. They're overcoming challenges. They're strong and competent. They're muscular and dynamic. Uh, it's almost, I don't, I don't know if I can compare it to say the artistry level of Michelangelo. I'm not a visual artist expert on that level. But for me as a 10 year old, it was like a Sistine Chapel of values. And what's impossible keeps changing. I, I, I literally am, I'm, see, I'm, I'm lost for words at the difference, for example, between chat GPT 3.5 and four, can't even imagine what 4.5 or five is gonna look like. When I was yeah. reading Atlas Shrugged and I see, you know, reared in metal, I think, well, what was the difference? The practical difference, the difference in real life between cast iron and stainless steel or between uh, 
you know, burning coal versus nuclear energy, if you want to talk about the motor, or even solar, which, you know, before the government got involved, was a very exciting technology. And there are all sorts of great things you can do with solar energy if nobody's forcing you to do it. So, <laughs> so all of that technology didn't seem that far off. And even things that now seem very far off seem like they're impossible. Well, let me go to question number four. Leonard Peikoff was asked, science fiction based well, on the scientifically possible is okay. But what about science fantasy presenting the impossible? And Leonard Peikoff says, in my opinion, that's just as good, just as fine. Because in both genres, the universe presented must be coherent and have some implication for our life, even if it's just a broad implication of a battle between good and evil and the good wins. Art is a recreation of reality, but it does not necessarily have to be a literal content of reality, as long as enough essentials are there that it is logical and understandable. I don't have any problem, for instance, with time change stories. Like the ones in which there's a time machine and you go billions of years into the future and so on. I just abstract away the impossibility and con I concentrate on the reality that is presented. And then he gives an example of, of stories in which you just change one element and you create an interesting proposition. Again, this goes back to Lee Pearson's discussion, the value of thought experiments and imagination. And my proposition, which is almost all thought has elements of imagination. Every scientific discovery has a what if that has not yet something that you know about reality. So yes, I 110% I agree. And I've got my list of pet peeves in in movies and fiction, because if not handled well, time travel can be the worst thing in the world. Magic, yeah. uh, multiverses yeah. seem to be a big thing these days. Uh, but Dr. Peikoff's exactly right. right. Handled properly and tied to real things, reality, powerful stuff. As a kid, it wasn't just comic books, but science fiction. I was, long before Ayn Rand ever got her hands on my mind, uh, I was a lover of science fiction and classical science fictions. H.G. Uh, Wells, uh, Time Machine, since we're talking about time travel here, uh, I, I did not for a minute understand or even un know either how the time machine worked or even believe it was possible that people could travel. And he he's there, he's got the little device. He can go in the future as fast as he wants or into the past and change things if he wants. So he doesn't fortunately go into the past to create this logical uh, conundrum that would necessarily occur. But so let's so let's ignore all those uh, complex questions about whether even time travel is possible and what logical uh, contradictions that would be. Let's just go with the idea with Mr. Wells. Now, of course, Mr. Wells was a Fabian socialist. So I don't share all of Mr. Wells, but I love Mr. Wells' science fictions. I loved the time machine. What a thought experiment. What will the future be a thousand years from now? My goodness, what, a, what an amazing ability to get us to think about things in a very abstract way, and even in a dramatic, semi-romantic way about it, if you can do that. Now, I love, as I say, classical science fictions of all kinds, it, not just H.G. Wells, but Jules Verne. Man, I loved, you know, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I ate that up as a kid. I loved Around the World in 80 Days. I loved that and ate it up. And you know something? Those, a lot of the things that Jules Verne imagined in his uh, science, like you pointed out, didn't exist at the time. But 50 or 100 years later, it did exist. We had submarines. We had the sort of technology that he was uh, discussing in a very advanced way, in a speculative way almost. And whether the, all those Jules Verne predictions, technological predictions came true or not, it reflects upon the his actual scientific uh, rationality to some degree. But even if they did come true, even if it wasn't a realized scientific projection of Jules Verne's, it's fascinating because he's sort of projecting what humans might do. Now, whether it's clearly something I you know, don't think is possible, like H.G. Wells' Time Machine, or something that, hey, maybe it's possible, like you know, uh, Jules Verne's sub Captain Nemo's submarine, uh, 
whether it's it's like I say, the difference between a young person, I think, and as we get older, is what we can suspend our the degree to which we can suspend our disbelief about something, and that is really the test. It's not a test to my view of metaphysical truth. It's a test of whether you're willing to go with that thought experiment. Okay, forget whether time travel is metaphysically possible. Let's just say for a minute it is. What would it be like if a man did take a time machine into the future? Okay, that sounds like fun to me. Let's see what we can do with that story. Um, and that's, I think, the way we have to uh, do it. Um, I'm a, uh, as a kid, I loved science fiction, especially American science fiction. I had Isaac Asimov, Frank Herbert, uh, oh, and of course, Robert Heinlein. Um, the uh, great American science fiction writers of the 20th century were also a big part of my childhood. I can't imagine my development without science fiction, without H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, Isaac Asimov, uh, uh, Robert Heinlein, and uh, Frank Herbert. Even where I disagree with them philosophically, they expanded my young mind and they gave me such a joy, such a pleasure, such a thrill at the possibilities of the human uh, potential, uh, such a thrill at the possibilities of the human mind uh, and, it, it, and stimulating my imagination in a value-oriented way. I really love science fiction literature and I think it's good for kids. Um, I'm gonna go that far. Outstanding. It, it, it ties to something we've talked about before. And it's it's funny to even mention that, that Leonard Peikoff has shared that early in his life and even early in his relationship with Ayn Rand and objectivism, he had rationalistic tendencies. And then he you know, eventually rooted this out in himself. And there have been people who have accused Dr. Peikoff of keeping some of that, of you know, some new issue comes along and they say, oh, that's his old rationalism. To me, he's he's the least rationalistic person, and it stands to reason they chose to call the anthology Keeping It Real, because he's so grounded. And there's a question, the next question we're going to address that, to me, touches on this in, in such a heartening way. And the connection won't be obvious at first, but I hope folks will get it here. Question number five for today. You included this question, which might not seem like it connects, but it absolutely does. Leonard Peikoff was asked, was Ayn Rand angry about the theft of her work by the Italian producers of the movie, We the Living? Seems like a reasonable question. While Ayn Rand was alive, she you know, was, was careful about how she was quoted. She made sure all of her copyrights were in effect and all of her intellectual property was respected. She gave some of the, the greatest arguments ever for intellectual property. But was she a rationalist? So Leonard Peikoff answers that question by saying, no, because that theft had taken place long ago by the time she found out. And she was already used to the way people would treat her in regard to violating her rights. Above all, though, the people who made it were anti-totalitarians and made this movie as a protest against Mussolini. So she certainly sympathized with their motive. Now, even stronger than that, she thought it was an excellent movie. <laughs> as a matter of fact, in my opinion, again, this is Leonard Peikoff, it's the best movie ever of one of her works, better than The Fountainhead. Oh, yeah. In particular, Ayn Rand thought the actress who played Kira, Alita Valley, was absolutely ideal for the part. If you're Perfect. interested in seeing that movie and if you liked the novel, that is certainly an excellent dramatization of her novel. Unquote Leonard Peikoff. Now, all of that is true. All of it excludes any bristling over the... I don't doubt that she would have fought to protect her copyright if somebody tried that in the States. But under the circumstances, she was able to consider the full context. Right. And react accordingly. We were at war with Italy. Italy was stealing uh, literary and technological uh, property rights all over the place. The, the enemies, obviously, this is wartime. 
there's all kinds of theft going on between <laughs> the parties, especially from these fascists and socialists that we'd be, be fighting. They would have no compunction, <laughs> whatever, about stealing intellectual property. Uh, and you see that in China today, of course. Um, these guys are thieves and parasites, as <laughs> they necessarily must be. But also, the truth is, there was not only nothing she could have done, not only did she not know it was happening at the time, but at the end of the day, my God, they didn't really have a working script. They went by the Italian translation of the novel itself. And the makers of the film, like Alessandrini, uh, were ferocious anti-Mussolini, anti-fascists. They, although he could get it permission to get it done because on the surface it's anti-communist, and the communists and the fascists weren't getting along at the time. <laughs> the, uh, so we could get it under the permission uh, wire from the government because it was anti, uh, because anti-communist. Nonetheless, it was clear as anyone can read the novel. It's anti. It's as much anti-fascist as it is anti-communist. It's against any dictatorship, and that was part of the anti-fascist filmmaker Alessandrini's motive in making it. So I think there was sort of a heroic motive actually uh, in sort of making it, and they were remarkably faithful to it. And I have to say, absolutely, Alita Valley was ideal. The best of all the dramatically cast actresses in it for an Ayn Rand uh, novel, she is surely the best in that regard. Uh, my God, she was perfect for that role. Um, and so, oh, pleased with the aesthetic outcome, <laughs> pleased with how faithful it was to her book, and since they were did have anti-fascist motives, uh, Ayn Rand, I think, was very understanding of it, just excited when her lawyers did find, uh, you know, uh, uh, a negative of it out buried outside of Rome and recovered the darn film, and so that she herself could supervise the remake. Now, I had to include this question today, because, of course, uh, we the Living is being uh, premiered in New York City, uh, and everyone could go see the new, uh, cleaned up, beautiful version of the restored version of We the Living, which is one of my all time favorite films. It is truly a gorgeous work of art, uh, one of the greatest uh, Italian films uh, ever made. Barna. You know, we talked about artificial intelligence and the state of technology, that they could take this film that was produced in the 1930s, and it was filmed well, so we had quality negatives, but it has now been, been upscaled to 4K resolution. The mm. clips they're showing online are just beautifully re-rendered, and it's, it's, it's again, it's another one of those cases where your jaw drops. It's hard to even believe that they've done as well with it as they have. So that's a real opportunity for folks. Speaking yeah. of opportunity for folks, we have a super chat, totally unrelated. Our super chatter says, I haven't, this is Buster Jones. Buster, thank you for your, for your contribution to the ARCU Can He says, I have an un unrelated question to this episode, but how can I grab a signed copy of James Creating Christ? Obviously, he's looking for a signed copy of this one. <laughs> That's a great question, James. Do you have any appearances coming up where you might be able to sign a book or, or do you have anything uh, sort of in line for the future where that might happen? I do not at the moment have any signing opportunities coming up, and it would probably be a localized one anyway. So what I would suggest wherever uh, our wonderful thank you for the super chat, well, uh, wherever you're from, uh, I'm very active on Facebook, and I would ask you to private message me uh, uh, through Messenger. Uh, uh, I'm, you, I'm pretty easy to find on Facebook. Uh, message me through Messenger, and we will um, um, see what we can do about getting you a saint, signed hardback of Creating Christ. Excellent. Yeah, I know, James, you're very busy, but you're also very, very uh, approachable. And uh, I try we... to be. <laughs> and I do try to get my, my work out there. So for people who do admire Creating Christ, please uh, write me with your questions or the Passion of Iron Earth Critics. Write me with your questions, privately message. I'm happy to do that. I'm engaged all the time on Facebook in both public conversations and uh, in private message conversations. Don't be shy. Please approach me uh, with any such request. Excellent. A great question and a great contribution. Thank you very much for that. And I'm going to jump to question six as we get well, not near the top of the hour, but we're getting close. So real quick here, because this is one that's come up before, but it's a, it's, it's a tough one, especially nowadays. You know, Amy Nacer and I have been watching the latest Star Trek, Strange New Worlds. And one example out of that is they have taken the old original series monsters, the Gorn, 
and have made them into really horrible supervillains on a par with the monsters in the Alien and Aliens films. And that was a big disappointment for me. They, yes, they made them much more menacing, much more of a threat, but we've really gone from watching an action or science fiction film to watching a horror movie. And so Leonard Peikoff was asked, is it wrong to enjoy horror films? From which I get the same feelings and emotions while well, I would get at a carnival fun house. Didn't Ayn Rand denounce horror movies? Hmm. Well, if that's your view of the universe, if that's your sense of life, like I say, I'm willing to suspend my disbelief on certain things. <laughs> so I'll, I'll suspend my disbelief on some questionable metaphysics. But still, if that's your view of the universe, uh, you know, if, if truly the world of vampires, be, humans being the prey of these supernatural uh, uh, demonic forces like vampires, if that's your view of the universe, that's a pretty negative view of the universe. I'm not sure that does reflect something psychologically healthy. And I'm not sure it would reflect emotional fuel, except under certain special specialized contexts. Let me put it that way. Right. And I know there are a lot of objective and, and prominent objectivists who are admirers, for example, of the uh, film Alien. Or was it Aliens? I know Yaron Brook is a big fan. Because... Alien and Aliens are both astonishing filmmaking. Now, the question is, on a sense of life basis, what is our evaluation? A totally separate question, it seems to me. Yeah, and it seems to, to connect to how much do you weigh the actions of the protagonist right. versus the situation that she finds herself in. You know, Dr. Brooke is, loves those films and obviously is focused on Sigourney Weaver's character who behaves not just I, heroically, but very rationally. I do too, at least the first two fil Alien films. I think they are really good films and I think Sigourney Weaver is a romantic hero to some degree, yes. Right. And in line with what you say, you know, Leonard Peikoff says she was against horror movies insofar as they were taken as art, serious art, in other words, as conveying a view of reality. Right. Well, if you take that view of reality, man is depraved and monstrous, the world is mystical and unintelligible, defeat is the end and so on. Well, you could see why she was opposed. If you take it as a funhouse, then I don't see any problem with it at all. In fact, when I was young, again, Leonard Peikoff, I disliked the city in which I lived. And I disliked the people that I saw. And I used to enjoy horror films because when Frankenstein chased Abbott and Costello, incidentally, we've watched that one recently, um, it was different. It was not like my aunts and uncles. Frankenstein was much more interesting. And he goes on to say, and this is where I agree with him too, I'm speaking, by the way, of the way things were in the 40s. I've seen one or two horror films from nowadays and they are so graphic that I can't watch. They're just too awful. When I was growing up, the genre meant a regular movie with exciting costumes and makeup. Yeah, uh, no blood and such. So, unquote Leonard Peikoff, I totally get that. Yeah, I can hardly sit through Saw 4 or something. I mean, that's just, uh, why? Why? Why am I putting myself through all this? It's just senseless. But Leonard Peikoff grew up in Western Canada, semi-rural, small town Canada, back in the 30s and 40s. And so for him, uh, uh, as he puts it, uh, horror movies for him were a refutation of folks next door naturalism. <laughs> and you could see that it would be a refutation if you grew up in Western Canada in the 1930s and 40s, how horror films would be something different, exciting, not the folks next door not ordinary existence, something that would get him out of transcend his uh, his soul, his mind, at least for that period of time, from the ordinary, boring, uh, rural Western Canada uh, growing up he had in the 30s and 40s. Yes, yes. We've got a couple more chats now. These are the free member chats. I'll let you in on a little secret, folks. If you're already a member at the Ayn Rand Center UK, but you're not sure you should sign up for the YouTube membership as well. Not only do you get access to some feeds like the Ayn Rand Fiction Club, like James, some of your study sessions through YouTube, which you can watch right on YouTube without even getting into the Zoom meeting, which you'll also be invited to as a member of the larger ARC UK, but you'll get a free chat, a free super chat every month. You would have spent five, six pounds on the chat anyway. So Kindred Amy in her free membership super chat says, I just look away, grumble, and shake my fist at the writers when it gets scary. I uh, I absolutely know that. 
and yeah. equal the reality also with a membership super chip member for 13 months you guys have been in since the beginning says great episode guys we'll have to rewatch well thank you i appreciate that thank we'll you. have to rewatch yeah. I've, I've told you before i rewatch these episodes i usually do them on the podcast platforms you can listen to these online you can there are 20 ways you can watch these because james while i'm watching the chat every now and then i miss one of the things you say and it turns out to be Oh my God, that was the best thing James said in that whole episode. So absolutely, I'm glad these shows hold up well for you for rewatching because they they certainly do for me. They do for me too. <laughs> 100%. Now, we're getting closer to the top of the hour. So I'm going to jump right to question seven. And then we got a few things to tie this up, put a ribbon on it, a little frosting on top, maybe a maraschino cherry or two. But question number seven, Leonard Peikoff was asked, how would you evaluate a person and here we're getting into you know those personal things again. Um, maybe, maybe, well, here, I'll just read the question. How would you evaluate a person who says he loves the Fountainhead, but loathes Atlas Shrugged? I mean, I I can't even. How, how do you, I can't even. I, love, I think the, I I love, think the I love food, but I hate water. I can't even. <laughs> I like I like water, but I hate air. I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Leonard Peikoff answers like this. He says, "Well, I wouldn't believe that he loves the Fountainhead because that is too great a contradiction for anyone to sustain." Yeah. Obviously, he's opposed to both, but I can look at it this way: he doesn't get any philosophy from the Fountainhead. He just gets a sense of well, an individual with integrity fighting against evil all of which is undefined. That very same guy could love Obama fighting against the reactionary conservatives and so on and so forth. It means nothing to him as a novel. He likes somebody strong, taking a stand, but it doesn't say anything about what stand or therefore how long does he want someone to fight for their cause? And Atlas Shrugged, by contrast, you can't come out with some floating generalities. You can't float the contents of that novel. The philosophy is unmistakable. Unmistakable. Therefore, he now knows, well, if you like Howard Rourke, you have to hate Obama. <laughs> that he can't talk of. He wipes out his pretense of individualism, and it plunges him into a whole bunch of things that are very unpopular. In that way, then, he doesn't love the fountainhead. He loves certain words here and there. You know, unquote, there, there's a limit. There, there's a lot you can do to separate out. I like this aspect. I don't like that. But there's a limit. Well, you know, Ayn Rand does <laughs> include in Atlas Shrugged many more philosophical formulations than she did in The Fountainhead. So I suppose one could agree with as much of the philosophy as she uh, showed in The Fountainhead and then disagreed about certain other philosophical aspects she made clear in Atlas Shrugged. But I suspect that's practically impossible. <laughs> that is a very, very small group. I suspect you didn't get the Fountainhead if you don't get Atlas Shrugged. The connections are so clear. It's true. I read the Fountainhead first. And basically what I got from the Fountainhead was an ethical, psychological, inspirational message in a way that was different than Atlas Shrugged, which got me to step back and think about broader social issues and metaphysical issues in a way that the Fountainhead had not. On the other hand, I knew there was an implicit sort of politics to, and I knew there was an implicit metaphysics to the Fountainhead. And what Ayn Rand was simply doing was answering those further questions, filling in those those aspects for me. But from an aesthetic standpoint, please, please. Yeah, yeah well, I'm glad you related it to yourself because I kind of had the same reaction. I had to remember, I read The Fountainhead in high school and thought it was a great story, but I didn't go any further with it. It wasn't until I was in my 20s, well into my 20s, that I reread it and then read Alice Shrugged. So I could imagine that younger version of me, well, not me, but somebody like me, <laughs> reading the fountainhead but still thinking well yeah but you know this just goes to show that power corrupts uh, money for example money is the root of all evil right well, you can't get through atlas shrugged and think that about money that, you can't right. you can't even that, speech. 
Well, you know, so... I mentioned in her introduction to the 25th anniversary addition to the Fountainhead that there were a couple of things that she probably would have changed, such as, you know, you're a religious man, Howard Rourke. And uh, she said, I thought I made his atheism explicit, but there are people who uh, wrote Ayn Rand fan letters who were religious people. Sincere, yeah. sincere I was so Christian. glad to see you made Howard Rourke religious. Religious, right. Or didn't understand the politics of it. And so, uh, right, and fully understand that there's a political implication to individualism, even though there's the courtroom scene and all that, uh, right? And Ellsworth Chewy's sort of political, you can see that there's a politics to it if you're reading closely. On the other hand, some people didn't see either the religious implications or the uh, political implications of the Fountainhead. And so I can understand Atlas Shrugged coming as sort of a shock where Ayn Rand is, is pounding those real hard and making it impossible for you to miss her the religious or political implications of her ideas. Yes. Uh, but aesthetically, as I say, there uh, you can I think you can parse the differences in style because they're just different uh, kinds of novels. One is an epic and one is a much more personal psychological up close study of individuals. Uh, so there's a sort of an approach difference in The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. Again, you might have a preference for one over the other, or you might have a preference for the poetry and the language of The Fountainhead. I, I happen to think The Fountainhead is the most beautiful prose ever written by an American novelist. Uh, on the other hand, I also happen to think that Atlas Shrugged has some of the most brilliant plotting any novelist has ever devised in the history of novels. So what I get out of each is a little different. But on the other hand, they're to me, they're in the same universe. When I walk into the Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged, I'm walking into Ayn Rand's universe. And it's the same universe. And if you don't feel that, you're missing, I think you're missing something. If you're if you're not thinking, okay, Atlas Shrugged is now about, about a bunch of Howard Rourke's. And okay, let's get into that. What would what would the world be like if we pan back and look at how the world treats Howard Rourke's in general? Okay, and that's the difference I saw in it. The world was still, the universe was still the universe of Ayn Rand. And great authors are like that. When you read their novels, you're entering their world, their mind, their soul, their universe. Um, and if you don't have that sense with their novels, they're probably not a very good novelist. And it's the same <laughs> universe if they're a good novelist. Yes. And by universe, you're not even talking about the particulars, because obviously the universe of We the Living is very different in the particulars than the world of Alice Shrugged. And yes. that's very different than the world of Anthem. And yet all yeah. of them are just totally identifiable as Ayn Rand worlds. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yes. Now, got a couple more Super Chats. Let me read these, and then I've got to talk about what's coming up and tie it into everything we've been talking about today. Adherent of Lady Columbia is back with another Super Chat. Thank you for that. And says, well, I've thought of a setting in which a god and devil exist and where mankind is punished and degraded, not because they're evil, but are a threat to both. That would be an interesting story and a great what if. Fascinating. Oh, no, 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 no. I have a friend who's very much influenced by Ayn Rand, and he wrote a short story where Superman and God have a duel. <laughs> so it's yes. not a question of putting God in the story or having some fantastic. No, 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 no. If the story itself is interesting, and if your theme justifies getting that fantastic, go for it. There's nothing wrong with departing from reality if it's clear what you're doing is making a metaphor making an allegorical statement. I would say this about fantasy literature more in general. And when we have discussions on Tolkien, I hope to make this point. It, uh, Tolkien very much denied any allegorical meaning to Lord of the Rings. But if there is a moral allegory, that's what would justify a fantasy. If he's making a moral point, I don't care if there's magical swords and dragons, and if he's making a moral point coherently, and that's a dramatic way of bringing it out. No problemo, in my view, so long as there's this literary justification for it. Uh, but Tolkien, unfortunately, denied the very value of his own work as a moral allegory. Uh, so, And that becomes dragons and magical swords as an end in itself. And that gets very boring for me rather rapidly. 
I, I, you know, I try and get into something like Game of Thrones, and I tried repeatedly to try get into. I know a lot of my objectives friends are into it are not going to like what I'm about to say, but I really could not, despite multiple efforts, really get into Game of Thrones because it just seems to me it's that becomes an end in it. Dragons and magic becomes an end in itself, and uh, I start falling asleep, frankly, unless there's a point a dramatic human psychological moral point that's being made that this is an allegory or a metaphor for right right okay. and then one one more answer comment. I wanted to give <laughs> I was going to say one more comment or question another super chat thank you for the support adherent of lady columbia and the question is is there a difference between the objectivists who read her public essays and talks and political works first compared to those who read the novels first? I don't have a short answer to that. That's a whole conversation. It would be, uh, great, to be great to have a panel big, big on that. Big answer. Most people come through the novels first because it's the emotional inspiration. It's the concrete connections that she makes in those novels that gets you interested enough to, because let's face it, reading philosophy, you've got to roll up your sleeves and do some real mind work. And it's nonfiction is more work than fun. So most people get into through the, the fun and the beauty and pleasure parts, the emotional parts of the art. But on the other hand, I've known people who read the nonfiction first and then got to the fiction and understood stood the fiction in a different way because of that. So that is a whole d d big discussion to have. Yeah, it's interesting because I see the, you know, I think of the five branches of philosophy and the second branch epistemology and the fourth branch politics. I see a lot of that from people who come in through the nonfiction and the third branch morality, more of the folks who come in through the novels and you know, art is the indispensable medium for the communication of a moral ideal. You can't yes, argue sir. with that. So. Good questions. I've seen both, but it's not as simple as these people are that and that. But I've seen yeah. all different variants across that spectrum. You it know, is a great question and a great conversation. <laughs> and speaking of great questions and great conversations, as we blow past the top of the hour. I we know. Used be, we used to be able to do these shows in under an hour, but you gave us <laughs> seven really good questions today. Real quick, coming up in less than an hour, at the top of the one o'clock Eastern hour, six o'clock in the UK, 10 o'clock in the West Coast, wherever you are. Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson is once again making noise. He was better for a while, then he got worse for a while. Lately, he's just, he's practically trolling his old self. He was on Twitter and says about YouTube, you've crossed the line and you're on the wrong side of history. I guess YouTube is now the enemy. So coming up in less than an hour, Jonathan Honig and Rozzy are going to be on discussing, well, Jordan Peterson is on the wrong side of history. On the Daily Objective, that is one that I'm looking forward to. But that's, that's not all. Happens. Wednesday is a great day for the Ayn Rand Center UK. And, and we do appreciate your support because you're making all this possible. Coming up at 5 o'clock Eastern, so 10 o'clock in the UK, 2 o'clock on the West Coast, whenever that is, wherever you are, Lee Pearson is going to recap. He's doing an episode recapping some cutting edge key concepts, and this won't surprise anybody, controversies. Yes, because Lee Pearson is always pushing the boundaries. And he is. He's, well, he gets I, us to think. He gets me to think like few people can get me to think. He, he really goes right to the cutting edge and explores things. And what an exciting opportunity for students of objectivism to see where the cutting edge is and where debates can still happen among really intelligent objectivists. It really is the cutting edge, especially in epistemology and psychology. If you're not on the HBL, look that up, Harry Binswanger's list. And the forums that he runs in between him and Dr. Binswanger, they really do push the boundaries. Anybody who says, well, objectivism needs to be open. No, 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 no. Objectivism is what objectivism is. But it doesn't mean that there aren't active minds actively pursuing things that were not part of objectivism, but are part of philosophy. They're doing brilliant work. Whether you agree with Dr. Pearson and Dr. Binswanger or not, you've got to catch this show at five o'clock. It'll give you a recap of some of the juiciest stuff that they have worked on, the discussions that they've had. Bob Stubblefield has been part of these discussions. Really smart people. They had Gene Maroney on people. recently. So I'm looking forward to that. Me too. And finally, tomorrow, I'm going to do an update, a second episode of my Here is the News. I'm going to put on my press hat. And I've got some important things to say that relate to the discussion, James, that you and I have had, to the discussion I had last Sunday with Amy Naser. I did an episode of my own show called 
it does not do to dwell on nightmares. You Dumbledore fans were expecting dreams there, I know. And I'm going to talk about the case for everything is great, the case for everything's falling apart, and what a rational perspective. This is going to be fun. I'm going to be a little silly, but I'm going to be throwing in a ton of facts, just facts. Yeah, and you know, I'll report, you decide. So that's going to be fun too. Tomorrow, yeah, on like yeah, on miss it. you're perfect for that topic, my friend. Oh, yeah, great. So much good coming. stuff on ARC. Yeah. I am, I'm really proud to be part of what the Ayn Rand Center UK does. I was recently asked as part of a project coming up, what, why are you on the Ayn Rand Center UK? What do you get out of it? And it was a great exercise just to write out my top five, and it was easy to do five reasons why. I am part of the Ayn Rand Center UK and proud to be. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. James, thank you for this great session, all of your great sessions, your study sessions on Sundays, but all the TDOs you're involved in as well. And all of you listening, huge shout out to you, your support, memberships, YouTube memberships, super chats. You help make it happen. If you don't have any cash in your pocket, like this show, share it with somebody. Easy ways to spread the word. We're all fighting for the ideas of objectivism. We're all fighting for the ideas of Ayn Rand. We're all trying to spread the word and make our own personal lives better at the same time. James, this was a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Take care, everyone. <laughs>